Welcome to this football show special on PLZ Soccer, sponsored by Arnold Clark. I'm Peter Martin, absolutely delighted to have your company. And our very special guest is a former Scotland internationalist. And I could go through every one of our teams, but I'm delighted to say Rhonda Jones is with us here to talk about her career, uh, among other things. Rhonda, delighted to have you here. Uh, I said I could go through all the teams. It would take me quite a bit of time, but Ayr, <laughs> Doncaster, Bells, Hebs, Celtic, Rangers, Glasgow. Glasgow City. It's hard to believe all of those clubs, it just seems like yesterday you were starting out. Yeah, definitely does. Yeah, I've been there, been about, Peter, but um, yeah, I've had a fantastic career. For internationals alone, I mean, 117 caps is something to be, I think, tremendously proud of. And at a time I look upon you and the group of players coming through is very much the pioneers of taking women's football stage by stage to, to the level it is now. And I think a few more levels that it has to go to become, you know, a really tight professional situation where women can make a living out of it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, would I love to be still playing in this era? Um, absolutely. Um, I think I was born 10 years too early. However, um, I see what they've got now, and I, you know I, there is that wee, wee bit of jealousy as well. As I'm really proud that that we were there at the very beginning. We were there when we were B category, you know, wearing men's hand-me-down kit, you know, at that very beginning part. Um, but now to see how 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 good they've become, um, it was a it was an honour to be part of that. You know, it really was, and to be like you say the the groundwork there. Yeah, I mean, it's special because of obviously our links. We come from the same village. We Obviously, our families know each other. So it's special for me to actually get the chance to say to you, first of all, people would know about you from the village because of your achievements. Um, how on earth did you suddenly find yourself drawn towards football? Um, my big cousin played <laughs> football um, and I used to watch all his games with Yet Farm. He was a goalkeeper over there and I, I just, he was my idol and I always wanted to go and I thought maybe one day the managers would, would see me at the side and go, right, okay, we need somebody on, <laughs> put me on, but he was my idol and um, later on in my life, my uncle played for Rangers, Tom Cowan, um, and I just wanted to, ever since I was little, that's all I wanted to do was play for Rangers and I just always wanted to play football. Yeah, I mean, it started out with a team that couldn't get any better for you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. At Air United, um, it, it took me a long time to actually. My dad was searching for a team for me, and I, I, I just played with boys up until, you know, I was probably. I actually didn't start playing eleven aside until I was fifteen years old, fourteen years old, and um, that was at Motherwell. Um, and then when I became too old, I went down to. I was recruited by Air United, and um, in that team was myself, Julie Fleeton, Gemma Fay. I mean, we all we all grew up together, you know, right through the ranks. And um, when eventually at that point, um, it was Cumbernauld that were the, the big team. They were all the internationalists, the seniors. Um, they were unstoppable. But we were these young kids just growing up together. And eventually we took over the reins and we were winning every domestic honour. Um, so it was fantastic. At that point, I mean, I sometimes think of you as the right back. I mean, was, were yeah. there other positions that you, you wanted to flourish in? I never felt as if I ever was a right back. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I much preferred centre back. Um, but my coach believed I was a, a right back and I wasn't arguing. I was getting a game, so I was quite happy to play wherever. Yeah, who were the who were the players at that time that you were playing against? You mentioned coming all the all the internationals. Who yeah. were the players there that you were looking at and thinking, oh, you know, the standards getting better and better. These the, these yeah. girls can play. When I was young, <coughs> um, it was Pauline McDonald. Um, she was the captain of the national team. Linda Brown, um, players like that. Pauline Hamill. They were all the kind of senior players that we all kind of looked up to at the time. Um, but then growing up with the likes of Julie Fleeton and Gemma Faye, um, they, they were my teammates as well as people that I looked up to also. What did it mean to you to be a winner in that team? Because you would have been a young girl trying to make your way in, a, mm -hmm. in, in an environment where w women's football hadn't really, you know, caught on. You were very much the situation where, you know, you couldn't earn a day-to-day -day living on it. No, absolutely not. We were still P2 
paying to play football. We were we were getting down into the dressing room and chipping in for the referee, and you know it, it was that kind of situation. Um, my dad was driving me from Motherwell down to Ayr twice a week, and then at the weekend to play a game as well. Um, so it was a big commitment for my my parents as well, you know. Um, but it, it, he saw something in me as well, and he knew that was my dream. So. He allowed me to do that. And yeah, you mentioned Julie Fleeting. I mean, a special player as well at international level. Yeah. Um, and again, is that the best of the the international players you played with? Uh, oh, definitely. She's definitely the best. Um, there is some spectacular players, of course. Um, Kim Little, namely Erin Cuthbert, um, fantastic young player. But I would say, yeah, she'll slag me for this because she's my pal. But she's definitely the best. Um, that I've played alongside, yeah. Yeah, and I, I've got to ask you, from Air United, suddenly, uh, you know, and I can remember actually some of the family saying, Rhonda's going to America. Uh, yeah. What was your thinking behind going to Florida? Oh, the sunshine. <laughs> <laughs> the sunshine in the beaches. Um, I knew people that had already went out there, um, and I always knew that I wanted to, to stay abroad. Um, I'd won every domestic honour with Air United at that point and I had um, I, I was given the Scottish Player of the Year, National Team Player of the Year and I just felt that I needed to spread my wings a little bit and I wanted to you know, go and achieve my dream which was playing abroad and I went out there and done that whilst getting my degree. Yeah, uh, uh, and again, you're in a country where did you immediately find that the standard was was better because America seemed to embrace women's football earlier. Oh, absolutely! They they have baseball, basketball, American football over there for men. So it wasn't a, soccer wasn't a big thing for for men over there as it was for women. Um, there was so many universities, but obviously the USA women's team were dominating at that point, and everywhere you you would look, it was just little girls playing soccer. Yeah, did it make you a better player? I believe it did, yeah. Um, I had to leave the national team. It was a choice that I was given the choice whether I stay here and I was on the national team or I leave and they would exclude me from the national team. And I made that choice to go. It wasn't an easy choice, but I knew that I could get my degree out there and play football every day in the sunshine. And here I was struggling um, to, to manage. I had to work, I had to go to college and I had to play football almost full time. Um, I found that really difficult, so I made the decision to go, despite being excluded for four years. Yeah, you think about how many, if you got 117 caps, you would have been yeah. up there with Gemma Faye, I'm almost certain, in caps if you'd stayed. Yeah, possibly would have been, yeah. Yeah, I mean, what what drew you back home? Um, because obviously you got your degree at that point, was there, a, was there a, maybe a temptation to stay there? There definitely was. Um, I had applied for my visa to stay over there and um, I'd been granted a work visa so I was working as a graphic designer over there. Um, it just came to a point, I was flying home and after four years I was reselected for the national team. Um, my, my coach Tony Gervais, who was the assistant at the time, he came over and um, saw us play and, and spoke to Vera Pau, who was the main coach at the time. And they started to fly me back for games and it was great just to see my family all the time. Um, but it came to a point where I guess everything changes in your life and priorities change. My sister struggled with her mental health at that time but she had a little girl and my mum was unwell at that point as well and just after I graduated my mum found out she had breast cancer. So I just felt like, you know, I've had enough fun over here, it's time to go back yeah. home. So that was a choice that I made. I can see a great family picture there of, of uh, all you guys. Um, I'm going to touch on your sister a little yeah. later on. Um, Hibs, Doncaster, Celtic, Glasgow City, Rangers, as I mentioned, uh, you've played for them all. Um, when you go back, obviously Hibs, is that the best part of your career here? I would say so. I really enjoyed my time at Hibs. That's the first club that I signed for when I got back and all of my friends played for, for Hibs, you know, and that made it just so much better to, to just be playing alongside your best friends, you know. Um, I really enjoyed my time there and we, we were very successful at Hibs. Yeah, how many, I mean, give me some of the names of the people you were playing alongside there. Stacey Cook, um, Gemma Faye again. Um, Can't get rid of her. <laughs> sure, yeah. Um, Suzanne Grant as well, Mandy Burns, uh, Lisa, uh, Laura Kennedy, 
Lisa Robertson? Now, here's a, a great question. <laughs> mm. I mean, I, I can remember giving you pelters for it and the amount of people that used to see you in a Celtic strip. Oh, I, uh, I mean, was, I mean, I'm not saying it's, a, it's not a difficult thing. There. There's Michelle Barr actually there with the yeah. photograph. I can remember actually being at that photo shoot there. But how did that come about? I just felt like Celtic at the time were a really up and coming team. Um, I really liked their setup. It was quite professional, it seemed. Um, they were training playing at Lennox Town. Um, I went to speak to the coach. It was uh, Robert Doherty at the time. And I really believed in his plan and I really believed in him. Um, so I decided to sign with Celtic. Yeah, uh, and uh, sc scored as well. Well, a few. Yeah, I was yeah. going to say to you, you know, not bad for the, I mean, look at that celebration. That was probably the only one that wasn't a header, to be <laughs> honest. Probably why I'm celebrating so much. <laughs> um, Glasgow City is the team that I think everybody looks at and thinks to themselves, well, they're the most successful. They're just unbelievable run of, yeah. of titles. Uh, and again, I, I would imagine for someone like yourself who's got the international experience, it would be good to actually fit into a team with so many players that would feature for Scotland. Yeah, a lot of the girls there were my teammates on the national team. Um, and I, the, my whole career, I, w I wanted to beat Glasgow City. They were the, they're the top team. Everybody wants to beat the top team. So my whole career, I, my, my aim was to beat Glasgow City, to knock them off the top spot. And it was a point where, after Celtic, I, I planned on retiring. Yeah. And um, the coach at the time, Eddie Walecki, called me up and said, I want you to sign with Glasgow City. And I was like, well, there's absolutely, I've, you know, went through my life wanting to beat you. I don't want to play for you, yeah. you know. And um, he says, well, let me tell you, your first game will be against Chelsea, your second game against Man City, and your third game PSG in the Champions League. And I thought, right, OK. Yeah, I'm <laughs> right, in. I'm in, right. Where do I sign? So I thought, you know, I, it was probably the only thing that I hadn't done in my career was play in the Champions League. And I thought, you know, I want to tick that box before I, I bow out. What did you think of the standard? Fantastic, absolutely. Did you, play, could you, did you feel as if you could hold your own? In Glasgow City? Yeah, just you personally, when you looked at the standard of players you were up against? Yeah, I played with these, those girls. Yeah. yeah, and I was still on the national team, starting on the national team at the so time. So playing against PSG, Man City, didn't hold any fears no, for you? No, it didn't, no. no. I uh, just relished the, the competition, really. Was it good that you, you, you get to a situation where you said you won every domestic honour with the air? It's a nice little fitting end to it all, winning things with Glasgow City. Yeah, yeah, that was my, that was going to be my kind of, you know, my final box to tick. And um, I thought, yeah, after that, I'll, I'll retire. Yeah, uh, but you didn't. You get, <laughs> I, I didn't. I think the swan song is the ultimate one for you. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I presume, oh, I'm ready to retire. And then suddenly Rangers come in, you're a dancer. Oh, I know. It was, it, I think, I put it off and put it off. And they'd been asking me and I was, ah, come on, you're a Rangers fan, you know, you know, play for the jersey and and I thought, no, I don't want to do it. And my dad, you know, my dad's a big Rangers fan, <laughs> as you know. And he was like, I don't I'm not gonna to say to sign for Rangers, but it'd be lovely if you did sign for Rangers. He really missed coming to watch me play. Yeah. And I come home that day with my training kit on, I was like, right, Dad, I've got something to tell you. I've never seen him smile so much in my life. So I'm so glad I did. I'm really so glad I did. I don't know if there's a better feeling than pulling on the jersey, the team that you, you've supported all your life. Um, it was fantastic. It was a great bunch of girls. So, yeah, I'm yeah. glad I did. Was it emotional for you when you finally hung up the boots? It was extremely emotional. It was just the end of a chapter, you know, and a, a change of your whole identity, really, you know. It, um, it was very difficult. Yeah. It was a sad... That, that day was... It was a sad day, but it was also a really, obviously, the end of a chapter. It was, it was a happy day as well. Yeah, uh, internationally, you know, 117 caps is something to be tremendously proud of. I mean, what were the highlights for you? Um, my first game when I was asked to come back from America, and they flew me back for, um, it was a playoff match against the Czech Republic, if I remember correctly, and uh, I started in the game. Uh, after being out for four years and I scored the winner in the 89th minute and put us through so that was one of the most special moments that I can recall um, uh, something that I'll never forget Yeah, do you keep a hold of many of those international strips? I do, I've yeah. got them all in my, my cupboard 
Yeah. Good, good. <laughs> I always, always say that to players, you know, you know, the amount of times I speak to guys like Ruffy and where's mm -hmm. your strips and they go, oh, they're up in a cupboard somewhere, you know, they're in a plastic bin bag in the loft, but, yeah. you know, these are things that you should cherish and, and look back Absolutely. on with great pride. I'm going to flip it on its head because if we've talked about your football career, the most difficult thing to phrase about talking about your family life is mm -hmm. Your sister, um, because I know she meant uh, such a lot to you. Um, Gemma uh, and you, uh, in the early days, you know, I see some great pictures of you growing up together. Uh, sadly, passed away at 29, way too young, um, and she had mental health problems. I would imagine you would have swapped your international career, your football career, everything, just to have her by your side. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, she meant the world to me. Tell me about her. She was, we were very different. She was almost five foot ten, dark hair. She was, she was loud. She, she would get in her room, you know it was her. Um, she was funny. She was just so funny. She was so loved. Um, she was just a wonderful person. She really was. The, her friends would call her the New York Hill Nightingale. She would always be helping everybody else. And when she, a lot of the time she was the one that really needed help herself. Now, with that in mind, mental health uh, problems, something that's really come to the fore uh, and people are now starting to make an extra special effort to try and say, look, these are the problems, this is the particular problem you've had. How difficult is it, first of all, in diagnosis to think my sister needs help? It was so difficult and for someone that, that I have never suffered really from a mental health condition, to, to go through that with my sister, I can't imagine what it must be like for people that suffer from mental health to try and seek that, that support and try and get that help themselves because it was so difficult for me to try and get that help for her. Um, so that's why I'm very passionate about it myself now. Yeah, did you see, I mean, how do you, spot, how do you spot the signs, first of all? I mean, even from the early days with your sister, yeah. did you, I mean, how do you spot it? How do you, first of all, say, there's something wrong? I, that's exactly what I did say when I came back um, one time from America. I, I thought that she was making choices that, that were kind of, there weren't great choices in her life at the time. Um, she was just trying different kind of coping mechanisms. She was struggling with life. Um, she was very down. She was shutting herself away. And then there was points where she was so happy that um, well, it would come across as she was on this high and it was spending all her money. And, you know, there was just so many signs there. Um, but very difficult to yeah. get a diagnosis. Is it fair to say erratic behaviour? Absolutely, completely erratic. It was just, and they started to learn, to see the signs that she's really starting to, you know, peak. She's really starting to go down now and, and she would begin to recognise that herself and know what was coming next. Yeah, she had two kids Yes. Um, that were the centre of her life as well. Um, I, I mean, do you think maybe in the marriage, losing, you know, the kids losing their dad as well would have been a, a significant factor? Yeah, absolutely. I think that was a that was a huge turning point for her um, when she lost her partner, uh, Gary. Our, our mental health just deteriorated really quickly after that. Um, yeah, she always kind of she always missed Gary, even to her last day. She still spoke of him. What do you do then at that point when you've exhausted every avenue you can? Um, at what point do you finally get the right diagno diagnosis on it? And, uh, you know, I know that you yeah. fought hard to try and look for the right diagnosis on your sister to get her the help yeah. before it's too late. Yeah, I think that, well, one in three people that go to a GP surgery um, is about a mental health condition. Yeah, at the moment in North Lanarkshire, there's no mental health practitioner in any GP surgery, which doesn't make any sense to me. So she's going to her GP and they're doing the best they can of what they know to prescribe her medication um, and send her to an NHS psychologist. So at that point, 
you're, you're looking for a diagnosis, you're looking, she was wanting to be better, my sister wasn't locking herself away, just struggling away with this, she was wanting to get better, so eventually, almost like she was like a guinea pig with different medication over the years, I mean from the age of 19, so for 10 years she was on different medications trying to find this, you know, magic solution um, to a point where my family had to pay to send her private um, in to, to a private place in Glasgow to get finally get a diagnosis. From that point, you're thinking, okay, 10 years of pain, she gets mm -hmm. a diagnosis. Um, did you feel at that point, great, we've got a chance to save her? I, we did, actually. When we got the diagnosis and finally we knew what um, our condition and we, we knew the treatment that she needed, we knew the medication that she needed, we both just, I was in the appointment with her and we just both broke down crying, you know, it was like a weight, like she could, could finally say, this is what's wrong with me and this is how I need to get better, um, but there was then the disappointment of going back to her GP and her GP then saying, yeah, but this isn't offered on the, the NHS, this treatment. So that was just another blow to her, you know, and I think by that time she was just, she'd had enough. You lose your sister. Um, mm. It's, I, I, you know, I don't think anybody can imagine at 29 losing your sister, your best pal. Yeah. What was that moment like for you guys? It's something we'll never, ever get over. Um, we knew, obviously, our whole life she'd suffered. Um, but it's not something that you prepare yourself for, it's just, it was horrendous. I can't even describe how, like, hurt we were that day just to get that phone call. I presume at that point she'd lost all hope, she was just looking for a way out herself and, 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 and took herself over the edge. Um, yeah. In a strange sort of way, losing your sister has inspired you to look for something to help others so that they don't suffer the same pain. That's exactly right. Um, just with the struggles that I went through trying to get her help, I thought to myself, this must be what everyone else in this situation has to do. And um, I thought our friends actually had organised um, a charity night to raise money and asked, you know, where will we donate this money to? What charity do you want to donate it to? And I couldn't think, my family and I couldn't think where we wanted to donate it to um, or somewhere that we found help from. So we decided to create our own charity um, so that we can help people that, that don't have to wait 13 weeks on a waiting list to see a psychologist that if they're feeling suicidal, if they're feeling struggling or if they need help with a family member's mental health, they can come in and, and see us at our hub. Now with that, um, I, I know uh, the hub, um, I know the charity night you've been running. Tell us a little bit about You Are My Sunshine and, and what it can offer uh, people, families who might have an individual, a sister, a brother, an uncle, an aunt who, who might be suffering from this. Yeah, well, we're a drop-in, um, so any, you don't need an appointment, you just come down. It's um, Every Monday we run from Brannock High School, 6.30 till 9. Uh, we offer free mental health courses so that people can become educated on mental health and try to understand how to help other people. Um, we also we have a drop as I say we have a drop in. You can speak to um, qualified counsellors. You can speak to one of our with a variety of staff, all voluntary. Um, but their mental health nurses there, um, just to sit and speak to, to ask for advice from. We signpost. We we have um, information. We've gathered information over the last year of all mental health charities um, across Scotland. So if we can offer the support they need at our hub, we, we can signpost to another charity. So for someone who's thinking, OK, I now understand what you do, how do they get in contact with you? How can they look to your website? Give us the address. It's www.yams.org.uk. Um, and we're also on Facebook, You Are My Sunshine Yams. Well, Rhonda, I, I couldn't sum it up any better. Um, it's uh, great talking to you about your football career, even better talking about the fact that in the darkest days of losing your sister, there's sunshine at the end of it because I think, you know, if you can save, I would presume from your point of view, you think if I can save one life, that, that whole Absolutely. thing's a success. Absolutely. Um, 
from your family's point of view, and I'm almost certain Gemma will be very proud of what you've done. Um, it's been great chatting to you. Thanks very much for coming in. Um, we'll give you more details on uh, YAMS on our website as well. But great talking to uh, Rhonda Jones. Uh, I think I've got it right this time. Air United, Hibs, Celtic, Rangers, Glasgow City. There was even Doncaster Bells as well for a wee period. I, we didn't get a chance to talk about that. That's probably the second part of a show. Um, thanks uh, for watching the programme. Uh, thanks to Rhonda for joining us here. And don't forget, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel as well. Welcome to PLZ Soccer. Why not join the football family and download the PLZ app? You'll get all the latest Scottish football news and up-to-date news on English and world football. There's also a feature here where you can record yourself talking about your favourite team. If we use the video, you could feature on our football show. For all the latest news in Scottish football, download the PLZ Soccer app in the App Store and in Google Play. Come and join the football family on PLZ Soccer. Thank <laughs> you.